Hi everyone, this is Jim. Um, this is the uh, fourth video in my series of videos on the middle game, and it's going to be all about planning and strategy in the middle game. So this is um, the, the last in these kind of introductory videos, and after this I'm going to get into the, the main ideas of the series, the top ten middle game ideas, starting with number one, attacking the king. Uh, and then number two, the isolated queen's pawn. So the idea I, I have is I'm going to alternate uh, themes between uh, tactically oriented uh, middle game ideas and uh, more positionally oriented middle game ideas and, and uh, cover the top ten. Notice that I started with number one instead of uh, starting with number ten and working my way up as usual. I just couldn't resist. <laughs> There's too many uh, interesting ideas in this uh, Attacking the King series. Uh, and particularly, I think I'll start out with the Greek gift sacrifice. Um, so anyway, uh, I just wanted to say about these videos, I, I've been very careful to point out the, the preceding ones uh, each time because uh, I think these videos build on each other and after you complete these four videos, then uh, all of these other videos uh, in the top 10 middle game ideas will be independent. And um, on each topic in these middle game ideas, like uh, Attack the King, this will be probably multiple videos. I'll cover different ideas of attacking and defending. Okay, but let's get back to this one. This is the final uh, video in this uh, four, four video introductory series, Planning and Strategy. So um, what is planning and strategy? Uh, let's start with a few definitions. Um, a tactic is a forcing sequence of moves that yields some advantage. So typically, typical tactics are things like forks and uh, skewers and double attacks, discovered attacks, those kind of things. Usually they win material, but you can also use a tactic just to uh, force some exchanges or force some changes in the position that, uh, that are favorable to you in some way or another. Now a plan is kind of the next level up from a tactic. A plan is an idea you have to accomplish some kind of intermediate objective in the game. For example, you might plan to uh, put your knight on a good outpost, but you can't just play it there immediately. You may have to play a few moves to prepare it. You may want to, your plan may be to put a rook on the seventh rank. Um, there's lots of different plans, and we'll be, we'll be talking about them uh, mostly in this series. And then um, at the highest level, um, I use the term strategy to talk about your long term approach to the game. So your default strategy is to uh, checkmate your opponent, and uh, that's uh, something you have in the back of your mind. If you see a way to checkmate him, you, you certainly should uh, go for it. But it doesn't help you uh, immediately uh, in planning out your moves, really. You need to come up with plans and, and work step by step towards that uh, long-term goal. So, so the strategy may be the overall uh, what's guiding your, your thinking, but the planning is uh, where actually you spend most of your time, coming up with little plans to uh, move you closer to your goal. So the idea is that um, a game would be composed of a series of plans, and each plan would kind of transform the position in a way that's uh, favorable to you. And at the end, uh, and you have a, a winning game, maybe the final plan is uh, an idea to transform the from the middle game into the end game, into a winning end game. So let's talk about uh, the general rules here. Um, Reuben Fine, with his uh, 10 rules for the middle game, had two of them devoted to planning. So the first one was have all your moves fit into a definite plan. And this is one of those rules you have to actually uh, question. Um, there are times when you don't really have a plan and uh, you just have to make a move anyway. It's a rule. You've got to move when it's your turn. You don't get to pass. Um, and so you have to find moves anyway when you don't have a plan. It's helpful to have a plan, but maybe not absolutely necessary. Um, if you're careful, sometimes you can play without a plan, just being sharp and alert to all the tactics and, and win quite a few games that way. So it's not necessary. And if you think about it, um, computers don't really have plans. What they do is they just uh, look at all the possibilities each time, look at all the possible moves and all the possible replies, and choose the move that uh, yields the best outcome according to some algorithm. And uh, they do that move after move, and they end up winning the game. So it's, it's not necessary, but it's, um, it's helpful to have a plan. What a plan does is it uh, can focus your thoughts a little bit, so you, know, you can't uh, be like a computer and really consider all the possible moves. A, a plan will help you... Uh, uh, reduce the number of moves you have to consider to ones that are uh, hopefully relevant to the game at hand, the position at hand. 
And then uh, the second of Reuben Fine's general guidelines is um, to attack the enemy king, you must first open a file or less often a diagonal to gain access for your heavy pieces. So this is an example of a, of a plan. Um, your plan is you want to attack the your your long term strategy is to attack the, the enemy king, but your your plan is to uh, open up a file uh, so your pieces can access the king. And this is uh, uh, a very good guideline. Um, but of course, the, the tricky part is determining when it's uh, appropriate to attack. You often will have to sacrifice something in order to open these files, and uh, you know you have to be sure through your calculation that those uh, those sacrifices are going to be worthwhile. Okay, so what are my thoughts on this subject? Um, my ideas, my idea is to, I think I, I just mentioned this before, is to think in terms of plans. Uh, in fact, think of a, a series of plans, each one of which transforms the game in some kind of favorable way. A uh, plan should be short, flexible, and specific. So attack the king is not a plan. Attack the king is more like a, a long-term strategy. A plan is, uh, like I mentioned before, Getting a piece to a good square, maybe uh, improving the pawn structure in some way, um, eliminating a, a backwards pawn or blockading one of your opponent's pawns. Um, it should be flexible because uh, you don't know exactly what your opponent is going to reply, especially if uh, some of the moves in the plan are not forcing. Uh, your, opponent, your opponent may have lots of different replies available, and uh, your opponent may make a mistake. You may make some blunder that you need to take advantage of right away because those chances don't come along every move um, and you have to abandon your plan. Um, it may be that your opponent will throw up an obstacle in your way and so you may be able to continue with your plan but you may have to be uh, allow yourself to be diverted, uh, respond on the other side of the board before continuing your plan. And your plan should be specific. So a vague plan like uh, I'm going to mate as king or I'm going to... Uh, <laughs> well, that's that's probably the best example. Uh, is is not that's not really a plan. What we're talking about is is a short sequence to accomplish something specific. So you have particular moves in mind when you make a plan. Um, so when you make a plan, you also, uh, in addition to uh, thinking of this objective, you also should think about the tactics and the position, and you should be willing to use uh, uh, threats and tactics. In fact, this is the most effective way to accomplish a plan. If your plan is accomplished through moves that don't threaten anything, that just leaves all the possibilities open to your opponent to, uh, uh, you know, continue with his plans, um, to obstruct your plan. It just leaves lots of possibilities. Whereas if you, your plan is composed of moves that are making threats and employing tactics, then you're, you're reducing your, the number of responses that your opponent has available to him. And uh, so it makes your plan more effective. Uh, you need to be opportunistic as you proceed. You can't just blindly follow your plan. You need to uh, be uh, aware of what your opponent is doing. And uh, like I said, if he blunders in some way or if something occurs on the board that opens up uh, a new avenue for you, you should be willing to change plans and uh, go after the uh, whatever the best opportunity is at the moment. Um, and then be obstinate. You should uh, not allow your opponent to thwart your plan, but uh, try to overcome his obstacles. And at the same time, you should recognize your opponent's plans and uh, try and stop them. So one plan you might have once you've recognized uh, that your opponent is trying to do something is simply to uh, <laughs> stop him from accomplishing what he's trying to do. So I have another page. This is... Uh, ideas for creating plans. There's um, lots of different uh, ideas here, and this is not a complete list. I just uh, wanted to throw out a few ideas there for your consideration when you're trying to come up with a plan. It's, I think uh, a lot of people get stuck at this stage. How do they, how do they come up with a plan? What do they, what do they uh, look for? So first of all, look for weaknesses in your opponent's position. Um, does he have loose pieces? Uh, in that case, you should be looking for uh, tactics. Is his king position exposed? In which case, maybe uh, you should be looking for uh, uh, plans that uh, get your pieces closer to the king and maybe even directly attack. Um, if you don't see any weaknesses around the enemy king immediately, maybe there are moves you can make to create weaknesses, such as uh, moving your pawns forward and uh, exchanging some pawns off to open lines towards the enemy king. 
Um, another idea for creating a plan is to create some kind of imbalance. So um, if you can overload some area of the board with uh, where your pieces just outnumber your opponents in that area, you can often um, win some material. And uh, if your advantage and force is around the king, then, then often you can uh, deliver a checkmating attack. So look for uh, how your opponent's pieces are distributed. Uh, you know, is if he has a you know a majority of pieces on one side or the other. You know, maybe you need to respond to his threats where he has a majority of pieces. But the other way of looking at it is uh, maybe you should look to the area of the board where he has fewer pieces, and maybe you can overload that area and and get some threats going yourself. Okay, uh, second source of ideas is in the uh, pawn structure. Um, and that's, that's what we talked about in the previous video. Look for those weak pawns. See if there's ways that you can fix them, prevent them from moving forward, and then just pile up on them. Uh, attack those weak pawns and see if your opponent is uh, capable of defending them. Um, blockade pawns that are isolated, that's often a good plan. That's a, a good square for, uh, makes a, a nice, nice outpost for a knight, for example, in front of an isolated pawn. Prepare some pawn breaks. That's another plan. We talked about pawn breaks in the previous video. Um, a plan could be uh, a few moves that uh, will help prepare a pawn break so that when the pawn break happens, your, your pieces will be well posted and, and ready to move forward into the uh, enemy position. Um, ideas with your own pawns. You may have a plan to create a passed pawn, which you can use in the end game, or you may want to create an outpost for your pieces and then occupy it. That can be a plan. Um, down the scale, other ideas for uh, planning. Um, you could have a plan around improving your pieces. Um, you may look at your own position, see that you have some loose pieces, and, and come up with some moves that uh, protect them. You may uh, identify, this is a, a commonly repeated uh, piece of uh, advice, uh, identify your worst piece and find a way to improve it. Um, I think a common saying is, uh, I think it's one of Tartikover's sayings that uh, the uh, uh, a single bad piece uh, will ruin your entire position. So if you've got some piece that's sitting there not doing anything and all your opponent's pieces are active, uh, then you're at a disadvantage already. So if you can identify your worst piece, uh, find a way to improve it. That's often the source of a plan. Um, find ways to improve your pawn structure. Maybe you've got some weaknesses, you've got some backwards pawns, or some isolated pawns. Maybe you can uh, dissolve them in some way by pushing them forward or by uh, provoking some exchanges. And then uh, last but not least, sometimes there is no plan, and uh, or you just can't think of one given the time strengths. Uh, you know, chess is played on a clock, so you have a certain amount of time to uh, come up with a plan. And uh, and if you don't uh, if you don't come up with a plan, you need to move anyway, or you'll just burn up all your clock time. So there are moves that do nothing. And um, there, are, there are reasons for doing nothing. You know, grandmasters talk all the time about playing waiting moves. Sometimes you're waiting to see what your opponent is planning, to, but uh, sometimes you're also waiting just because you don't have an idea at the moment. So a good waiting move is to take some piece um, that can easily be moved back and forth. Particularly, I, I use the word unoccupied. By unoccupied, I mean uh, a piece that's not doing any job in particular. So if, uh, if, you have, if your pieces are tied down defending, defending your pawns, then, then this is difficult to, d to find an unoccupied piece. You don't want to move a piece away and give up material. But um, if you have a piece that's not uh, defending against some immediate threat, you can just uh, move it and then move it back the next move. So find a, a piece that's easy to move. Uh, often it's easier to kind of shuffle your rooks back and forth than to try and find some uh, clever knight move. Um, the thing is, uh, we're really talking about pieces here and not pawns. When you, when you push a pawn, that's not doing nothing. You're doing something. A pawn move is something that you can't take back. So, uh, so if you're one of these people, actually, I have this problem that, uh, when I can't think of anything, I, I sometimes just push my pawns <laughs> and, uh, sometimes that's good because, uh, you know, pushing pawns can, uh, uh, create weaknesses on your opponent's pawn structures, but uh, you don't get to take those pawn moves back, and they also create um, they create weaknesses on your side as well. So pawn moves should really be considered and should be made as part of a plan, um, whereas a piece move you can often make and then retract without uh, any harm done other than the loss of time. 
So I had a game here to illustrate these uh, concepts. Let's uh, bring up the game. I found this game on uh, chessgames.com. It's a game between um, Aaron Nemzovich with the white pieces and uh, Jose Capablanca with the black pieces. And it has uh, notes by Capablanca. And I'll, I'll include a description, a link to the to this uh, game in the description. Chessgames.com actually has quite a, a, a collection of games by Capablanca with uh, his notes included. So it's uh, pretty interesting to take a look at. Anyway, let's let's take a look at this game. Uh, e4, e5. We get the four knights defense. Knight f3, knight c6, knight c3, and knight f6. So right here, um, uh, Nimzovich plays an unusual move. He plays bishop c4. And if you've watched my uh, opening basic series, you know actually that's a bit of a mistake because after bishop c4, um, black already can just uh, grab this pawn on e4 and then play the uh, center fork trick after after uh, white uh, takes takes the knight uh, and get a good position. That's a, that's a decent position for black. Um, so uh, Capablanca's comment on this is that uh, the normal move, bishop b5, that would be uh, the Spanish four knights, is stronger, which is uh, generally true. Uh, Nimzovich must have had a new idea in mind when he chose this line in preference to the other, which he generally adopts. So both players know that bishop b5 is really the better move here, but uh, Nimzovich is trying out something. And uh, Capablanca, instead of going for the, the center fork trick, uh, maybe staying, steering clear of main lines, he just keeps uh, developing. Goes bishop c5. He avoids bishop b4 because of the move uh, knight to d5, kicking the bishop. So this is a decent position for his bishop. Uh, both sides continue normally. Bishop, bishop cancel out. The, the pawns come to d3 and d6, and then white plays bishop g5, pinning this knight. Um, and now right here, uh, Capablanca comes up with his first plan. So, so far these are just uh, routine opening moves. And uh, here Capablanca plays the move bishop e6, and he writes in his notes, with the idea of driving the queen's bishop back at the proper time by h6 and g5, and thus bringing the game to a position full of complications and unknown possibilities where black hoped to outplay his adversary. So this is uh, an example of a, using a plan to transform the position. He wants to take us out of a standard opening into a, a new position, a new position that is complicated and uh, where it's not necessarily better for him. He's not saying that this is going to be a position that's better for black. He's just saying it's going to be complicated and he's going to be able to outplay Nimzovich. Um, so what's interesting about this, I mean, the moves uh, h6 and g5, one interesting point about this is uh, he doesn't explicitly say how that's connected to the move bishop e6. Why is bishop e6 played first if his plan is to play h6 and g5? And that might be a point for you to uh, consider if you want to pause the video and think about it. I don't, I don't have a definite answer. Uh, he doesn't answer the question in his notes. Um, but I think in general, uh, this move strengthens the king side a little bit. So these moves h6 and g5 are weakening his king side, and uh, it really might come under attack. And so developing his bishop here, uh, challenging the bishop along this diagonal and protecting the f7 pawn might be a, a necessary bit of strengthening before engaging in the somewhat risky moves of h6 and g5. So that's that's my thought here. Um, Nimzovich doesn't trade bishops here, which is certainly an option, but he decides to uh, just keep the pieces on and uh, establish a pin on this knight. And there's actually a point to this which Capablanca recognizes. But first, he plays the first move of his plan. He plays h6, kicks the bishop back. That's a forcing move, so he doesn't have to worry too much about white's response there. He can play h6. And, uh, but now he uh, starts to think about this move bishop to, um, bishop to b5, what it intends, and he d reacts to that rather than continuing with his plan. So this is an example of being flexible in your plan. He has this plan of playing uh, h6 and g5, but he's not going to play it regardless. He's going to pay attention to what his opponent is doing, and he's going to modify the plan accordingly. So he's, his thoughts are that this pin on the knight is preparing the move d4. And when that move comes, it'll come with a tempo on this bishop. So he wants to get away from that, and plays his bishop to b4. Uh, Nimzovich now continues with d4, and this introduces another threat, d4 to d5, forking those two pieces. 
And so Nimzovich plays a move here, bishop d7, and not only um, gets away from that fork, but it also unpins the knight. So he's uh, played two moves away from his plan, but he still has the same plan in mind. And after um, castles, he goes ahead with it. Oh, he plays one more preparatory move. So a uh, castling has unpinned this knight. And um, one of the advantages of playing g5 here is that it unpins this knight and puts pressure on the center. And uh, this knight here, together with this bishop pinning the knight, uh, puts pressure on the e4 pawn. In fact, it threatens to win the e4 pawn. And so to renew that threat, and also, in a way, you can think of this as introducing the second plan. He gets started on his second plan before he finishes his first one. But he knows he's going to be able to finish his first one now. He takes this knight off to weaken the e4 pawn and plays g5. And the bishop drops back to uh, g3. So there's a cute comment that uh, Nemzovich has, I mean, uh, Capablanca has here in, in the, the notes. He says, uh, there were a dozen spectators around our table. One of them Nimzovich's father, a fairly good player, and they looked at one another when they saw the bold course I was pursuing, reckless on my thought on my part, they thought, and bound to bring disaster, especially after my next move, knight takes e4, when I had not castled and my king was in the center of the board. So definitely this uh, plan, the, now the second plan that uh, Capablanca is embarking on, is a bit risky. He's, he's uh, doing operations in the center, opening things up. When his king has not yet castled, and also his king position is a bit weakened by these pawn moves. So he's taking some risks here, but uh, he has calculated ahead in this uh, second plan, and he thinks it's going to uh, to turn out well. So the move of his second plan, it's it really the second plan started with this uh, bishop takes c3 before his first plan had completed. Uh, he continues by taking this pawn in the center. And now um, this doesn't actually win material at this point because uh, White has a way to get some material back, which he uh, he employs. He takes this knight and gets gets back the material. Um, although Capablanca criticizes that move, he thinks really that um, White should play Queen D3 here as the best way to uh, try and create an attack against uh, Black's somewhat play, unusual play here. Create some pressure on the king side um, and not worry so much about the material. But uh, Nimzovich decides to get the pawn back. He grabs this knight here. Bishop takes. And then pawn takes. Pawn takes. And bishop takes e5. And so uh, so white has gotten the uh, pawn back. And it looks like this bishop is pretty aggressively posted here. But Capablanca has the move f6. Ah, he didn't play that immediately. He traded queens first. He took the queens off. Rook A to D1 and then played F6. So the queen trade is actually part of the uh, third plan in a way. So uh, it's, it's interesting the way these plans are kind of interleaved. But he knew he had this move F6 in reserve. And uh, this is uh, his comment. This is the key to my maneuver in this variation. I had counted on it together with King F7. That's how he's going to get his king off the back rank and connect rooks. Um, when I played g5. So let's go back to the position where he played g5 and see if uh, if that's something that's difficult to see. So uh, this is his second plan here. He's, he's eliminated this pawn. He's going to play g5 to break the pin and he's going to take the pawn on uh, e4. And after that he recognizes there's a possibility of this exchange of his knight and winning the uh, e4 pawn. And if the bishop comes to e4 attacking his rook, he knows that he has the move f6. And I think, uh, you know, it's uh, a little bit tricky to see all of that, but it's not uh, superhuman. I think that's the kind of thing an average player could puzzle through. So that's uh, kind of one of the things I like about this game. It's like it shows his planning, but it also shows it being done at a scale which is uh, definitely doable. You just have to notice that the knight on e4 is going to be protecting this pawn when it comes to f6. So if the, the bishop comes to e4 here at the end of these exchanges capturing the e4 pawn, he has this f6 move to gain a tempo and get his king to safety. And so um, 
So that's how far he's planned ahead at this point. And it's this second plan that actually uh, gives him some advantage. So g5, there's this uh, bishop drops back, he grabs the pawn. As he's further exchanges, white grabs a pawn. He takes the queens off, which wasn't strictly necessary, and then plays f6. But, um, and so this has completed his second plan, and his comment at this point is that um, it might have been better for white to play knight e5 rather than uh, d takes, or bishop takes e5, if we back up to this position. He could have taken back with the knight instead of the bishop, but um, he thinks that black is better in all variations. So the second plan has transformed the position from that complicated, uh, 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 from the complicated position he was trying to achieve in the first uh, plan to a position where he thinks there's a slight advantage to um, black. And uh, if you look at this, I think you have to agree. Let's see, one more move. The bishop drops back to d4. Um, but, uh, well, let's pause. I mean, the bishop is going to move to safety. We don't have to consider that. Uh, and he's going to move his king there. Um, let's just take a look at this position and see if we can figure out why black is better here. Uh, first of all, the material is even. Um, this knight is pretty well posted, so that's one thing that uh, black has in his favor. The second thing is that these pawns are doubled over here, so black has the better pawn structure. And the third thing is that uh, black's king is more active. So his king is going to be closer to the center when we truly get into the, uh, into the uh, end game. Now, we're still kind of in a late middle game stage. There's, uh, there's a lot of force on the board. The king has to be a little bit safe. But uh, the king can tuck itself away on f7 and be, uh, be in pretty decent shape. Uh, let's see. Here, black has a choice, actually. Black, uh, I mean, white. White has a choice. Nimzovich retreated his bishop to d4. He could have also gone for this pawn, um, in which case uh, rook to c8 would chase the bishop away and he, white would end up uh, winning these pawns on the c file. So that would probably be good for uh, good for black as well. But uh, bishop d4 is another another way to play this. And now he goes king f7. And he says now the black king is more useful than white. And now at this point I think um, we can talk about having a strategy. Uh, at this point Capablanca has convinced himself that he's got a winning endgame in store. And keep in mind that uh, Capablanca is famous for being one of the strongest endgame players of all time, so he's always uh, happy to go into the endgame. So he started this, uh, this final phase with, uh, his, uh, with this strategy of just uh, reducing the force on the board and just, uh, just transposing as quickly as possible into an endgame. And so at this point, you can think of uh, both levels operating. He has this long-term strategy now of, uh, of just exchanging down into an endgame and winning the endgame. And at the same time, he's still going to be using plans to accomplish that long-term strategy. And um, let's see, white plays knight d2 here, challenging his knight. Um, and uh, what Capablanca's comment is at this point as he says, notwithstanding the bishops of opposite colors, I did not hesitate to exchange. He's not afraid to trade the knights. Um, the um, those who wish to learn, <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> there's a um, Capablanca was never overly modest. <laughs> so let's see, those who wish to learn would do well in studying this game. It is one of the finest end games I ever played, and I have often had the great pleasure of hearing my opponent play, pay tribute to the skill. Uh, displayed by me in winning it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he had a share of vanity. Um, okay, but there's a point about this trade I want to make. He doesn't take the knight right away. What he plays, Capablanca plays rook h8. And this is one of those ideas I talked about in the uh, when I was talking about peace play. It looks like um, uh, Nimzovich is going for the trade, and... Um, and Nimzovich is going for a. Nimzovich recognizes he's a little bit worse, but he's going for an end game with bishops of opposite color, and hoping to draw it. And so Nimzovich is going to be provoking some trades. So, um, so Capablanca not being afraid of the trade, but not being, um, not feeling it. It doesn't. It's not necessary for him to make that trade. Uh, he can just support that knight 
and then if uh, white chooses to make the trade, then black's pieces come forward. So he doesn't have to do anything in response to this knight d2 move. He just develops a piece and uh, protects his uh, protects his knight with another piece. He actually has a choice of taking back with the bishop or the rook. There's probably uh, a case to be made for either one. So Nimzvich doesn't want to take here either and uh, and uh, bring black's pieces forward. So he plays the move uh, f3, kicking the knight and really forcing things. So now that the knight comes off, knight takes, rook takes. And uh, Capablanca brings his other rooks to the center. So there's no real plan operating. He's just operating move by move at this point, with the idea, though, that he wants to exchange down into into a uh, winning endgame. Um, Nimzovich plays g4. This sort of helps make some sense of the f3 move, gives a little space for his king, and stops black spawns from coming forward. And now uh, Capablanca begins uh, what I think is the third little plan, in this um, game. He plays the move bishop to b5, and what he's doing, he's playing this move with the idea of bringing a rook to the seventh rank. So this is the idea, so this is an example of a plan that is being used to support a strategy. So the strategy is exchange off all the pieces and win the end game, and the plan is to place the bishop here and, and bring the rook to the seventh rank. Um, and there's also a neat little tactic here. So um, in this position, the uh, rook is under fire. He plays rook to b1. Cancel that. Rook to b1, attacking the bishop. And Capablanca drops the bishop back to uh, a6, which looks like a really weird square, but it does two things. It keeps alive his uh, plan of playing the rook to d2 here, e2, I guess. And uh, it also defends the uh, b-pawn, which is under attack from the rook. And now this uh, rook goes back to d1, just uh, lining up here. Um, here's, here's the tactic that's pointed out. Uh, at this point, you might think it's natural for white to start um, getting his king in the game with the move like king f2. But king f2, here, let's erase some of these other arrows. King f2 uh, actually loses material. So here's a, a little tactical quiz for you. Can you see why king f2 cannot be played in this position? Okay, I'm going to give the answer away. King f2. He didn't play that. Um, so let's... <laughs> it's a new variation. Okay. There's the move c5 here. Really a strange... Well, it's not, not that strange an idea. There's this pin on the bishop. So c5 is a threat anyway. And normally um, you would just drop the bishop back here to defend the rook. That's the way to get out of this pin. But in this case, you can trade... And then the check here wins a piece, so you win the bishop. And uh, once again, it's this bishop sitting here on a6, uh, the uh, relic of his plan of bringing the rook to e2, actually winning material. And so this, this little tactic here uh, prevents white from improving, uh, improving his position with the natural uh, king f2 move. Anyway, so white goes with rook to d1, defending this uh, so this c5 move is no longer a threat. And now rook e2. So he completes his plan. He uh, didn't uh, manage to play uh, bishop b5 and rook e2 all in one move because there was this intermediate challenge to his bishop. He drops back, but then he does get in the rook e2 move anyway. So we get another pair of we get a pair of rooks exchanged. Rook takes, bishop takes, and now rook e1 kicking the bishop, and the bishop takes on f3. So a bit of a risky move here too. Um, but uh, but black emerges a pawn up in uh, all variations. Um, the thing that makes it a little bit dangerous is that uh, there's this rook f1, and now black's uh, bishop and rook are coordinating on the f6 square. But this is where um, where Capablanca has calculated ahead and found uh, the right move to deal with this situation. And once again, it's this idea of c5. So uh, this might have been a third plan, actually. Having, having gotten this exchange, he might have conceived this idea as, as a third plan of taking here and playing c5. I mean, a fourth plan. The third plan was getting the rook to the... Uh, the, the, uh, the third plan was getting the rook to the second rank and provoking trades. Yeah, so this is probably the fourth plan in the game, starting with this, this move here and then playing uh, c5. 
Um, and this, he says, this is the move that gives black the advantage. There's different ways that uh, white can respond to this. If he, uh, what's, what are the examples he gives here? If rook takes f3, then c takes d4, and uh, rook to d3, trying to win this uh, pinned pawn, and then rook to c8. And for all practical purposes, uh, black is a pawn ahead. He says he's got an extra pawn over here. And, um, yeah, it looks like, uh, well, well, white can grab a pawn, but he'll be able to grab the, uh, the C pawn here. So he's happy to play this position with just a rook endgame. Um, so Nimzovich goes for the bishops of opposite color endgame with uh, this tricky move, bishop takes f6. Bishop takes, no, oh, c5 was played. Bishop takes f6. And now um, he plays rook to d1, getting the rooks off. Um, bishop drops back to uh, e5, getting away from the king, and uh, there's this exchange. And now there's a long endgame from here. Let's see. Oh, he continues with bishop takes g4. So he gets one more pawn. So he stays um, a pawn up. And his comment is here, the ending is now won by force. Um, several months after the game was played, when Nemzovich had come to St. Petersburg to play in the All-Russian Masters Tournament, he told me he had studied the game and that he thought he had finally found a way to draw this ending. Although I had not seen the game since it was played, I offered to make him a small sporting bet, giving him odds of a draw in any position from now on. The offer was immediately accepted and we sat down. In a few moves, he saw that his idea was wrong and gave up the game. <laughs> So uh, I'm not entirely convinced that, that Black is winning here, but Capablanca was convinced. That's the main thing. And uh, he managed to win the game. It's a long uh, end game, kind of interesting to look at, but I'm not going to go through it. I'm going to uh, stop at this point. I just wanted to uh, 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 reinforce, I guess, that that final plan transformed the position once again from a, a middle game to an end game where uh, Capablanca was confident that he had won. So I think it's a great example of the use of a series of plans, each one changing the position in some favorable way and ultimately uh, resulting in a win. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and uh, stay tuned for uh, the, uh, the top 10 middle game ideas videos that I will be uh, making shortly. See you then. Bye.